านแล้วก็ขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่งานประชุมประจำปีสวทชนะคะห้องนี้จะเป็นเซสชั่นนำเสนองานวิจัยของนักวิจัยรุ่นใหม่และนักวิจัยรุ่นเยาว์นะคะซึ่งล้วนแล้วแต่เป็นนักศึกษาทุนของสวทชและเครือข่ายทั้งหมดนะคะห้องนี้จะเป็นการนำเสนอผลงานทางด้านเทคโนโลยีทางด้านการแพทย์เทคโนโลยีสำหรับผู้สูงอายุและผู้พิการนะคะนี้ขออนุญาตเข้าสู่ตัวกิจกรรมนะคะวันนี้เราขออนุญาตแนะนำอาจารย์นัทธีนะคะเป็นผู้ช่วยศาสตราจารย์ดรนัทธีสุรีนะคะจะกรุณาเป็นแชร์แมนในห้องประจำห้องนี้นะคะแล้วก็เป็นสปิเกอร์ด้วยนะคะเป็นท่านแรกอาจารย์นัทขออนุญาตแจ้งประวัติอาจารย์นัทธีนิดนึงนะคะอาจารย์นัทธีจบการศึกษาปริญญาตรีสาขาเคมีจากมหาวิทยาลัยเชียงใหม่นะคะแล้วก็ปริญญาเอกสาขาชีวเคมีและชีวโมเลกุลนะคะจาก University of California นะคะแล้วก็มีได้การศึกษาหลังปริญญาเอกสาขาวิทยาศาสตร์การแพทย์โรคติดเชื้อนะคะจากคณะแพทยศาสตร์มหาวิทยาลัย UCLA ประเทศสหรัฐอเมริกานะคะขอเสียงปรบมือต้อนรับอาจารย์นาทีด้วยค่ะครับ So I guess they told me to speak in English. <laughs> so we we'll conduct the, uh, the whole session in English, bilingual mostly, because uh, some of the students are more comfortable with Thai language, so they can speak in Thai. But for the plenary speakers and also some of the students at the PhD levels, they will be speaking in in English. So, all right. So um, it's such an honor to be here. I never give a talk at uh, NASDAQ before, and this is. Kind of like my home, you know. Everything kind of started from here. I got the JSTP scholarship as the first generation, the first year of JSTP, and we call it the, the guinea pig <laughs> year because um, we are the first. And also, um, I got inspired by uh, such esteemed um, scientists of Thailand, and then you know got uh, advanced into uh, more more science and become a scientist. Um, so today, I'd like to give you. A glimpse of what I've done, or our lab has done in the past seven years uh, at Chiang Mai University. Since I got back um, from my postdoctoral training, and we initiated the lab in um, Chiang Mai University, and and mostly doing the drug discovery for HIV, and um, um, and now we are trying to find a cure for AIDS. So the topic of this uh, talk will be a modern approach of. Integrated preclinical drug discovery for HIV pathogenesis and eradication. So, I'd like to start my talk with the portrait of this man. Do you know who it is? Have you ever seen this guy? He's the most famous guy in the field of HIV/AIDS because he's the only one. Well, not until last month, but he was the only one who was HIV positive. And then was cured to become HIV negative. The only one in the world who has been positive. His name is Timothy Brown. And good news is that um, uh, the another group in London they also found another one. He, they they make a patient just like this guy to become HIV negative after um, doing the bone marrow transplant as well. So Timothy Brown is called the Berlin patient. He was anonymous for a long time, for a few years, and people call him the Berlin patient because he's a patient at the Berlin Hospital. And uh, the uh, doctors over there kind of conduct the whole thing to cure him from HIV. So uh, let me remind you a little bit about HIV. So if we have the viral particle. Um, trying to get into our host cell, in this case, is CD4 positive T cells, and on the surface of our cell, we have the CD4 receptor molecule, and another receptor that is very crucial for the entry of the viral viral particle that nobody knows about uh, until recently is CCR5. This is a co-receptor. The main receptor is CD4. We all know that, but The the second guy that is very crucial and essentially the key for this whole thing is the co-receptor CCR5. So the uh, viral protein GP120 and GP41 will connect with all of this, and then they try to fuse into the cells. 
and has the viral life cycle and so on and so forth. However, if you go back for Timothy Brown, he's HIV positive. He's been treated with highly active antiretroviral therapy, just like when you got HIV positive and then you go to the hospital and go see a doctor, the doctor give you heart, the um, H-A-R-T. Unfortunately, unrelated to HIV, he also has AML, acute myeloid leukemia. He had cancer, right? And it's very progressive. So the traditional way of treatment will be doing the chemo and doing the radiation. And um, it, it's been going well for a while until um, it, it, he has the recurring AML. The cancer came back, right? So the final option would be bone marrow transplant. So the doctor at Berlin Hospital, you know, got the bone marrow from a donor who is Delta 32 mutated at CCR5, which means the CCR5 molecule, remember? That is defective. It's not functioning quite well because it has the deletion at 32 um, nucleotides. Uh, and then this donor is quite spatial, right? Because he has this mutation. He gave the bone marrow to Timothy Brown. So they did the bone marrow transplant and he got double bonus. He has no ML, no cancer, and also no HIV, even though he doesn't have to take any antiretroviral therapy. So this is all great. And this happened like 10 years ago and he's still now undetectable for HIV. So he is the only one who's, um, who's been treated and successful. However, bone marrow transplant is not for everyone, right? Because it's really hard to find a donor who's like HLA match. And if you want to cure HIV, you have to find mutation of the same as well. So um, the frequency of this mutation is very low and only be found mostly in the uh, white people in Scandinavian countries. And that's only like seven to 10% of the whole population over there. You and I all have um, CCR5, so we will be <laughs> infected with HIV if we become in contact with HIV, unfortunately. So what's the alternative for um, finding a cure for HIV? So if you take a look at the continuum between before exposure to the virus, you are a normal person, HIV negative person. Now we can have what we call pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, which means we can take the drug to prevent uh, the infection to occur if you are at, a, at high risk, you are a high risk group. But once you got exposed to HIV, you become contact with uh, some, someone with uh, HIV through the uh, blood-borne pathogens or whatever, um, you can take PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. This PEP is what we call antiviral therapy or HART, it's a highly active antiviral therapy. This is not curative. It's not a cure for HIV. If you take a drug every day, diligently, then you will be fine. But after a while, if you stop taking a drug and after a while, the virus will come back. So, so that's the problem, that, that we cannot find a cure for HIV. This is the problem. So what we are trying to, um, to do as a, whole, as a whole field of HIV right now is that we try to find a cure for HIV. Okay. So why is it so hard to find a cure for HIV? Because there's a, a very tiny population, it's called latently infected cells, which means these cells are sleeping. The, uh, at the process of the cells getting sleeping, they try to get to sleep, they get infected with HIV, and then they go to sleep. And when the cells sleep, there's no active um, function of transcription or translation or whatever. And uh, the drugs that is highly active active retroviral therapy, uh, they cannot work on the inactive cells. They can only work with only active cells, the, the waking cell, not the sleeping cell, right? So what we are trying to do is that we try to study the latently infected cell. We know that 
in lately infected cell, there is no de novo viral protein synthesis. Nothing's going on in terms of protein synthesis, especially the viral protein synthesis. And it is also undetectable from the human immune surveillance and cannot be targeted by normal heart. So what we try to do is, well, they are sleeping, we need to wake them up. So what we uh, use in our laboratory is that we try to chalk them with um, new anti-latency inhibitors, try to wake them up. And I, I can show you in the next few slides like how we can do that. But once they wake up, they will produce new HIV, but they can present themselves that, aha, this is infected cell, and we can deal something with it. Um, for the newly produced HIV, we can use just a normal antiretroviral therapy drug to protect from the uninfected cell, the naive cells. But for the one that has shown itself that it is infected, we can use the immune killing using cytotoxic lymphocytes or CD8 positive T cells. And that can help us flush out all of these cells that have been infected. And also the HIV can be submitted uh, into the undetectable level and hopefully the full eradication. <clears throat> so what, um, there are a lot of targets to wake them up. One of the targets that is most promising is um, histone deacetylase. So if you remember in your biology class that um, in the chromatin we have DNA and we also have histone protein, right? And in order for a gene in, in this chromatin or DNA to be expressed, it needs to kind of relax out and let the transcription factor to come in. So this whole process of relaxing the chromatin to release it out, to expose the gene, or to become tightened again is highly, highly regulated, very controlled. Um, for for example, this is the one part of the chromatin that has a lot of genes, and this is the um, the histone protein. At the histone protein um, around it, that's the what we call a lysine residue, is an amino acid residue. Normally, lysine residue has a positively charged, but in this state of the hyperactivated state, it is acetylated. It has a acetyl group on the the lysine or the gamma chain. So uh, this state, um, the chromatin is relaxed and then become accessible for transcription factor, which means the viral transcription can occur. This state is what we want. We want them to be woken up, right? And if there's an enzyme that is called histone deacetylase or HDAC, it will deacetylate or take out this acetyl group from lysine and the lysine residue become positively charged. The DNA is negatively charged. Now we have positive and negative, so it becomes tightened. It binds together very tightly. And it will curl up, become compact, and become inaccessible for the transcription to occur. So what we want to do is to inhibit HDAC and reverse it into the hyperactivated state. So what we're doing in the lab actually is finding an inhibitor to inhibit um, histone deacetylase enzymes. So this is the research, just to give you an overview of what we've done in the laboratory. Um, we have two drug targets, two types of drug targets in our laboratory. Um, the first one is anti-HIV, just trying to find you know highly active retroviral therapy. Um, and the other side of the lab is trying to find a cure for HIV. We have a bunch of targets for anti-HIV, like um, HIV integrase or chemical receptor 5 or CCR5. Uh, for the HIV cure, uh, aside from the histone deacetylase, we also do the protein kinase C as well, or PKCs. Um, if you divide um, our research area um, into basic research and applied research, we also do a lot of things. But most of the time that we got a grant money is from the applied research. 
which is the drug discovery platform and also trying to see the transcriptome base of the drug toxicity. But what I want to tell you a little bit more, what we discover from doing all of this is that we also get the basic research the knowledge as well, the new finding in the basic research as well. And one of which is the dynamics um, activity relationship. So since we are trying to find a drug for curing something, even um, cancer or diabetes or heart disease or um, infectious disease, this is the common pipeline of the whole process of developing a drug, right? Um, it started out with the high throughput screening. You have a bunch of chemical libraries, uh, probably like from 10,000 to 10 million. And um, you can do this, keep doing this, and then you get some of the candidates that is really, really promising. And then you do chemical modification and structure activity relationship to see if this structure of the chemical compounds will give rise to um, a potency that is probable for the next development. Um, and you can do the structural biology. You have the compound, you have the protein, you try to see how it looks, how it binds. And then you can confirm with the cell-based assay and um, eventually in the animal model before doing the clinical trial. This whole process, the preclinical drug discovery. However, this type of pipeline is quite problematic because you know, like high throughput screening, it has a lot of false positive and false negative, and it's very expensive to set up. Most of the time we use the robotic system, and that's quite um, costly. A high cost of library as well, you have get the smaller set missing out. The bottleneck is the chemical modification. The chemical synthesis is also taking a lot of time in this whole pipeline. And another bottleneck is doing the structural biology, doing the X-ray crystallography or NMR um, structure determination. The cell base is supposed to be far earlier, sooner, in order to confirm with the, with the actual reaction that's going on in the cells. So we came, we came up with um, a revised uh, preclinical pipeline that we incorporate the computational part to help guide the screening process. Rather than using only high throughput screening, we use the computer because this is 2019 and the computer is quite you know well known and has a lot of application and very fast, very high performance already. So we were able to do a lot of things. And then we going through the cycles of doing protein assay and structure uh, activity relationship and cell-based assay and chemical modification before doing the toxicity evaluation, which can be applied by the computational method as well. And before going to the animal model, just go very fast. So um, these type of pipeline, we have to um, rely on the performance of the computer and the, the structure of um, of the protein as well. If the structure is high quality, then it will give rise to a, a better and accurate result. So normally, um, we, we have to take a look like where is problematic in the whole pipeline. So normally, if you want to develop a drug or do the assay or test a drug, you come up with a bunch of chemical compounds. Then you do chemical synthesis. And then once you got the chemicals, you can test with your cells or with your protein assay or your enzyme or DNA or whatever. And then you can get new drug, like candidates, right? It's not actually new drug yet, but a new drug candidates. So what I'm trying to do is that this is the bottleneck. This take a really long time, one, two, three years. How can we bypass this step that is the bottleneck of the whole pipeline? Wouldn't that be nice to skip the lengthy step of chemical synthesis? So what we uh, try to do is use the computer to calculate it all out. This is the work done by our next speaker, <laughs> my PhD prodigy. Uh, he's um, he's used the, oh, no, this is QSAR base, sorry. So the QSAR base is the ligand base. We take a look at the lichen, just only the compound, and then try to predict, use the um, mathematical model to predict whether uh, it will be successful or will be like a failure 
for that compound without looking at the interaction with the protein at all. This is the lichen bed, looking at just a little lichen, right? And we screened like um, 239,000 compounds in several libraries and we got a few candidates that we can work with. This is one of the, the strategies that we use in the lab. And when we test it, we use what we call the medium throughput of cell-based assay. Uh, we use the cells that has the genome of HIV. We have the HIV genome in the, and also fused with the uh, green fluorescent protein in, inside of this genome. So if this cell got chalked by our drug, for example, like a uh, HDAC inhibitor, it will produce the HIV RNA and also HIV GFP protein. And the GFP is green fluorescent, so we can detect the expression um, looking at the green fluorescence. And we also get the new, newly produced HIV particles, which can be detected by uh, P24 GAC ELISA. Um, and you can get the EC50 that way. This is one of the results that we use um, the lichen base, and we came up with um, several of the compounds that is quite um, good performance uh, at the nanomolar level. Um, what we want is around uh, tens of nanomolars, or even lower if possible, but this is a good starting point. Um, these compounds are from just only the lichen base. So um, I told you about the lichen base, and now I just want to give you like the whole idea of what bases are there, right, for the computational method. Um, there are actually mostly three um, types of uh, approaches that we we can use. The first one is receptor base. Um, the one example is the docking. You know, you have the protein and you have uh, your compound, the lichen compound, and then you dock them together and see if it fits well. If it fits well, the, the binding energy will be very low, uh, negative level. Um, that's the receptor base because you have to let, take a look at the receptor, which is the enzyme as well. L lichen base, you're looking at the structure of the lichen without doing anything with the interaction with the protein at all. You don't, you don't want to uh, see that at all, you're just looking at the lichen only. The newly um, developed technique is the dynamic space, and we try to incorporate this in our experiments. Um, sorry, this is not 3D QSA. But these type of um, experiment has some you know, drawbacks or some advantages as well. For example, for the uh, receptor base, it can give you a novel scaffold, but poor accuracy. For the lichen base, it has higher accuracy, fast, but it has to be within the common scaffold or not too different. But for the dynamic base, it's kind of, you know, combine the, uh, the advantages from these two techniques, but it's much slower. So it needs a lot of computational time. So what we try to do is just um, try to use uh, mathematical model to put this data, like rich of data, and put into the prediction model. For example, if we um, if we know the PIC50 or the, the potency at half maximal activity, uh, if we know that uh, in the experiment, we can also try to predict what it would be as well. Um, as you can see, if you use just only docking, which is the receptor base, not the dynamics base. It's, it doesn't give rise to anything like relevant or any correlation at all. But when we put into the weighting constant using the mathematical tricks and try to come up with the model, it's gonna give you some type of correlation. But these red dots are the the trainings, uh, the the test set, which is the the real thing that we want to see. We didn't get any you know good enough result at all. But we got published a long time ago because this is from the receptor base, the docking. It's quite huge uh, if you do the docking and then you can get the, the, the model. Um, the general feeling in the field of trying to do this, do the prediction model, is that um, it will be a holy grail if we can just draw 
chemicals on your computer and then can predict whether the potency will be high or low or no potency at all. That would be the whole goal, the, the main goal of the whole field. So we use uh, two of the techniques of the mathematical models. One is PLS and another one is um, self-organizing math. As you can see, it's not that great, but in it is within the, the error level. And um, this guy, Pachara <laughs> uh, also use a, a bunch of techniques, well, to come up with a better idea uh, of getting the, the better resource of input data. And in this case, we found that uh, from the docking, we have very poor quality of the data, and it's not good enough. So we try to shift that into MD simulation, which is molecular dynamics, um, instead of um, seeing just instant photo, just one photo, we look at it as the whole clip of movie to see the movement of the protein when it's bind to the um, to the to the lichen, right? Which is more natural way of happening things. Which means that when you take a look at the interaction between these two entities, the protein and the lichen, you cannot look at just only the fitting or the shape. You have to look at the behavior, how they dance together, how they move together. And we come up with some of parameters to measure all of this and put into the um, molecular mechanics calculation. And that will result in um, different energies of binding, which can be subdivided into uh, a bunch of parameters as well. One of them will be one while um, electrostatics and solvent accessible and the polar energy. And we use all of this parameter to put into the predictive model construction using uh, the POS model. And we can come up with the model that is quite accurate. So this is what we got. Um, if you do the auto prediction, you got very good results. And if you do the, the training and test set prediction, the red dots are the, the test set, which is what we want. And we got quite um, satisfactory data as well. So this is very exciting. Um, it's the first time for this type of enzyme um, we do integrates, right? We do HIV integrates for this work. And um, this is quite a good starting point to, to get even better um, of the prediction model. So in the future, you may not need to do experiment at all. You can just draw in a computer, put into this type of model, and then it will tell you whether this lichen of this compound will be successful or will be a failure. And then you can synthesize just only some of them that you are really interested in, and then you test that in the test tubes. Um, from this study, we also found that um, the main parameter that is highly correlated to the area of the binding is the delta G SASA, so an accessible surface area um, energy. And this one is quite exciting because all of these key residues kind of are located in, in, inside of the binding site, and we can measure how they are important to the binding, which means we can determine um, all of these subsites of the binding site, which one is more important and which one that we should care about. This is the basic science that we got. So for example, if we have um, a very good uh, inhibitor, you see all the um, blues. But if you have some of the bad ones, um, very low PIC 50s, you will get all the green and the yellows, and which means they are not contacting all of them. So what we want is a better inhibitor that can contact all of these residues, because these residue will be determinant, will be the thing that will determine the future or the fate of, of the inhibitor, whether they're going to be successful. So the concept that we came up with, or the model that we came up with is like this. All of these guys are the um, amino acid residue sitting together and decide whether the one ligand will be a good drug or a bad drug, uh, will be a successful inhibitor or be a failure. 
So, but now we can calculate it out who are the kings and the queens of this committee. And we can measure it out whether these are the most important or not. And the whole concept of this is that um, not only that we can predict which one is important, we can predict which one is more vulnerable for the mutation. For example, if this guy who is not very important, but important enough to be at this table, if this guy is uh, mutated, then maybe the drug is still functioning quite OK. You don't need to develop a new drug. But if this guy who is the king got mutated into something else, then the drug will become resistant which means that if you can predict this, you can develop the drug before the mutation will occur. And the patient will not have to wait until we develop five or six years of the drug and then use that in the patient. You can develop ahead of time. So this is the power of um, using computational. Uh, I'll just skip this one because it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> this is a little bit more, <laughs> I think I have just only five minutes. Uh, we also use the targeted drug delivery as well. Once we got the drug, we want to send out the drug to just only the bad guys, the bad cells, the one that is infected with HIV. We don't want to send the drug to everybody, right? So it's kind of like you sending uh, a post, something like a package to a specific person. You have to label at the package and also put the zip code and everything in the address and send to just only that one. We don't want to send to everyone in the country, right? So this is the whole concept of sending a drug. So we can label the package using um, biotinylated anti-CD4 monoclonal antibody because what we want to send out to just only CD4 positive T cell. We don't want to send to CD8, CD34, or different type of other cells, but we want just CD4 positive T cell. And we use this package that is called nanoliposomes, and we put the drug into this package, and we send that into the cell. So when we um, do the experiment, we found that if you put um, liposome and with the drug different percentage, you can see the uptake of the drug liposomes very efficiently. And this is very good news. Um, if you increase the drug, for example, uh, if you use the liposome version of the drug, it can uptake the drug even more when compared to just only the drug in the solution form. So um, it not only that it increased the specificity to the target cell, it also uh, increased the uptake of the drug as well. Um, we can also combine with uh, bryostatin, which is another kind of uh, pathway, another pathway for reactivating the um, latently infected cells. And we found that if you have just only single drug, you got some level of uh, reactivation of the cells, waking up of the cells. And if you add together with HDAC inhibitor, you have HDAC and also PKC activator, combine them, you get even higher and more prominent um, signal. Um, other than that, uh, during my postdoc year, we also try to develop mice to be human. <laughs> uh, we call this humanized mice. To be humans in terms of the, the, the immune system, we take out the whole immune system of the mouse and we put in the human hemopoietic stem cells, uh, the human cells inside of the mouse, and do the transplantation of the human fetal liver and human fetal thymus, and also the hematopoietic stem cell. So this mouse can be infected with HIV. The normal mouse cannot be infected with HIV, right? Because HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. It will infect only humans. Um, so we try to make this mouse be infected with HIV, so we can use this as a platform to test the drug or to test the gene therapy or test uh, different pathogenesis of the drug, uh, pathogenesis of the virus. Right now, in our laboratory, we try to integrate all of these um, techniques and technology. Um, for example, we use artificial intelligence and also the targeted um, library screening and so the, um, the functionalized liposome that we package this drug and uh, target into the specific um, cells. 
in the next step that we are trying to do is using the next gen sequencing to see the whole transcriptome. When we put drug into the cells, we don't know whether the drug will act on only our targeted enzyme. It might act on other things that could cause side effects. And we try to take a look at the whole transcriptome to see if they are. So we will use this as a model. And we also have some of the animal model we'll set up in the future. So um, I have a lot <laughs> of people to thank for, um, especially at CADD, which is our Center for AIDS Drug Discovery at CMU, um, all of the uh, PhD grad students and master's degree uh, grad student, and our CMU collaborator, um, uh, Ajahn Subha from Kazakhstan University, who is my um, TIF mentor. Um, we are collaborating with Barry Chaplet, who's um, at Scripps, Research Institute and my old laboratory at um, uh, UCLA School of Medicine as well. So that's it <laughs> for my talk. Oh, just one thing. Um, we also accepting postdocs and PhD. So if you are interested in this type of work and working with us, then you are welcome to just give me an email or something. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if you have any questions or comment, just press your hand. We try to make this more like a relax, you know, not too serious. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> he just graduated um, last month? Yeah. That's fine. This month, yep. Um, my, my very first PhD, he was also JSTP. Which JSTP are you? Four? No. Fourteen. Nine. Yeah, okay. So, um, JSP won, and he's um, nine years later. So, yeah. Do you have any questions? We come to have a time. We have a time. We have a time. ถ้าถ้ามีคำถามก็ทีหลังก็ได้นะครับถามถามข้างนอกก็ได้ตอนเบรกก็ได้นะครับงั้นก็น่าจะประมาณนี้ขอบคุณมากครับผมสวัสด